Hi everyone, my name is Abby McKee. I am Executive Director of Portland Baroque Orchestra and it is my privilege to welcome you to this digital town hall. Today's production is going to be around 60 minutes and we will spend the first 30 minutes with me telling you some things about this past year, sharing some of our thoughts for the future, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. And with this digital format, Q&A will be handled through our YouTube chat. So as you have questions, as things pop up, please go ahead and just type your questions either in the comments of YouTube or in the chat feature. And for that second half of today's program, Rachel Smith will be joining me here on set and we'll have a conversation that's prompted by the questions that you've entered into that chat. Those do pop up to us in real time with like maybe a two second delay. So feel free to just chime in at any point with something that's on your mind, any question that you have, and Rachel will be bringing those to us in the second half of today's program. So uh, I first wanted to welcome you to Studio Great Arts, which is PBO's live stream studio and soundstage. We are in the heart of downtown Portland. We're actually about a block from Pioneer Courthouse Square. And you have already seen this studio, of course, in our several stage announcements, but also for Toma Ilyev's Bulgarian music program a few months ago. And you will have access to this space for our upcoming Mozart Piano Quartet program on July 2nd. I urge you to mark your calendars for that premiere. This space has been an incredible gift to us. We are incredibly grateful to Menashe Properties, who's provided us this space for the COVID-19 crisis and for several months to come. And we will be back in this space for a number of other programs, including a series of live streamed performances that I will tell you about as we kind of go through today's talking points. So Studio Great Arts, this is our, this is our home for the time being. And of course, we look forward to welcoming you back in person in our concert halls, and I know that's top of mind for everyone. Don't worry, we'll get there. Before we get, get into that portion of the program, I did want to share a little bit about how Portland Baroque Orchestra is weathering the storm that is this past 16 months. It's hard to believe we've all been in this for 16 months together. We are actually doing quite well, and we miss you terribly, and we miss our musicians terribly, but we have weathered this in really quite excellent financial shape thanks to some significant government aid through the form of PPP loans and a grant from the Oregon Cultural Trust with the CARES funding, um, and also some additional grants from many of our main funders, including the Collins Foundation, Ronnie LaCroote, and a number of other wonderful, wonderful people who are credited at the end of our programs. If I've left you off, please do not, uh, do not take that as a sign of our lesser gratitude. But uh, we have a really wonderful balance in our bank account right now, thanks also to a thousand gifts from people like you who've made contributions this year. And of course, we are about to launch our year-end, our fiscal year-end fundraising appeal, which I'll tell you a bit more about momentarily. So we have made it through this, thanks entirely to the generosity of people like you and to, and to our funders. This has been a year where, generally speaking, we're able to count on about 50 to 55% of our income from ticket sales. This year we had zero dollars of ticket sales, uh, just like many of our other arts peers. And thanks to the generosity of people like you stepping up and making donations, we've weathered the storm just fine and we are ready to welcome you back uh, very, very soon. So thank you so much for your support. And uh, we, we are just really very grateful and we feel incredibly privileged and very lucky for that. I also wanted to just let you know that our entire staff is intact here. We did not have to furlough or lay off anyone on our team. We're really grateful. They're all here in the studio with me right now. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge their incredible efforts this year because this year that entire staff transitioned into a video production crew. Uh, one thing that we have been able to do that I know a lot of our peers have, uh, have ha taken advantage of uh, other wonderful film production companies in the area is we have become our own film production crew. Uh, and if, uh, if we were able to spin the camera around and, and show you the space, you would see we've got a couple of cameras, we've got our own lights, our own equipment, audio gear, and that has enabled us to bring you an incredible number of programs this year. We've produced 27 videos. Uh, we've served over 135,000 viewers. 
we've had a worldwide footprint, and it has all been admission free. And if you see me looking over there, I've got some very high tech giant sticky notes with all of my numbers and figures on them. Uh, but this has all been, again, thanks to people like you, because without ticket sales, we've had to do all of this through contributed revenue. So thank you so, so much. I know that also top of mind is how our musicians are doing. And of course, that's an incredibly high priority for us as well. Our number one priority this year has been managing and protecting the health and safety of, of course, you, our patrons, but also our workforce. And that absolutely includes our musicians. So you may have noticed that you've seen small ensembles primarily comprising Portland-based musicians, and that's because we have wanted to make sure that we've been able to socially distance people, we have not asked people to fly, we have not asked people to travel, um, but we have wanted to keep as much work going as humanly possible for our incredible players because, of course, artists are among the most vulnerable people in this pandemic, people who who work from gig to gig, and, and for them, their livelihood has been put on hold for this entire year. So I also want to give immense kudos and immense gratitude to all of our musician employees who have spent this year cobbling together uh, a whole new world involving digital programming and, and all kinds of other new ways of sharing their art with the world. They have been incredibly gracious as we've embarked on this grand experiment that is digital programming. Uh, they've had an incredible sense of humor about it, and they've been wonderful partners in this project. So thank you to all of our PBO musicians and, of course, to all of the people uh, in the world who are producing great art right now uh, in this incredible time of weirdness and adversity. If you want to keep up with our musicians, please join the Baroque Inquirer newsletter. We have a blog post from our Musicians Weekly, and we are very much looking forward to having larger ensembles together in the very, very near future. You may have also noticed that I am sitting here unmasked and I have referenced the fact that we have a room of, of our staff here in the studio and that's because all of us are now vaccinated and our musicians are also all vaccinated and so that is going to allow us to do larger, larger projects as we move forward. We are incredibly, incredibly excited about that. So we'll be announcing a bit more later about how we're going to handle return to live performance um, and what requirements will be uh, required for that. Um, one last really important group that I feel like it's incredibly important for us to acknowledge is PBO's extraordinary board of directors. And that board is led right now by our amazing chair, Bette Worcester. A year ago when this began, our board really had to take a leap of faith that embarking on digital programming was the right thing to do. And they did that with all discernment, but without hesitation. They also, at that time, chose to unanimously support a increased side mission of us providing our digital film services to partners here in the Portland area and beyond. And so Studio Great Arts, this space that we're in now, will be shared with Portland's, art, Portland's arts organizations and other artists, and we hope people will take us up on this. And we are just so grateful that we have this heroic board supporting these new initiatives and sticking with us throughout the weirdest year ever to be a board of an arts organization. So thank you to our entire board and thank you to Bet for being a leader in this, in this crazy storm. We could not do this without you. So next season, I know this is really the thing that's mostly on everybody's mind. And I know that the biggest thing is the return to live performance. I'm sure many of you have seen the, uh, the season announcement that we released last week, but I want to reiterate, right now the plan is evolving and we commit to returning to live performance this coming spring, early in 2022. We're working out the details of that because of course they are ever changing and we want to make sure that everybody is safe and that we're able to accommodate all possible requirements uh, so that we can do this safely, protecting both you, our patrons, and our workforce, both our musicians and our staff, and of course our wonderful volunteer ushers as well. 
That announcement of live concerts will follow. We are well underway in planning those, and we will be announcing more about those live concerts later this summer or early in the fall. And tickets will go on sale quite a bit later, probably sometime in the fall. We will be reaching out to our subscribers first, because of course you have supported us through this entire thing and we have not forgotten you and we are eager to get you back in the concert hall. And following that, tickets will go on sale to the general public just a little bit later. Uh, we always give our subscribers the, the first opportunity to join us for the best seats at the best, best prices. And so when that subscription announcement comes out, if you want to get in on that, I urge you to consider subscribing at that point. We don't know yet about things like seats, where we'll be exactly, how many people will be in the hall, what mask requirements will be, what vaccination requirements will be. All of this is certainly evolving almost daily. And as this becomes clearer, we will be sharing it with you. But for us, it's a small team here that's highly, highly committed to making sure that you have the best possible concert experience. And we will be communicating more about that as we know, as it becomes clear. We do have a subcommittee of the board that is also working on a return to live performance plan. And I believe we will be reaching out to patrons at some point in the coming months to start sussing out things like people's priorities and how do we engage our wonderful, extraordinary community in returning to live performance. So again, subscribe to the Baroque Inquirer for the latest and greatest on that, and you will be hearing from us with questions, I'm sure, in the coming month or two. In the meantime, we are embarking on a digital concert calendar for the fall, and we will also be including a digital program in the spring. So spring will be a both and kind of scenario. In the fall, we will be presenting two grand performances, the first led by Byron Schenkman and the second led by Gary Thorwado. Byron's program, which we are filming in just a couple of weeks, will include multiple harpsichord concerti, so two by J.S. Bach, one by Wilhelmina of Bayreuth, who I believe was Frederick the Great's sister, but don't, uh, don't hold me to that. Byron will be the, the expert on that one. And then we have our first ever, as far as I know, world premiere. We are going to be premiering a brand new concerto for early instruments by local Portland composer Damien Jeter. And we are so excited about this. And Damien will be joining us here in the studio for some of the, some of the talking portions of the program and will also be joining us uh, for rehearsals to help bring that music to life. And what an immense privilege. Our project with Gary Thorwado is what we're sort of in-house calling a not Messiah. It's a great light, Messiah's American journey. And that program will include works from Messiah, arias primarily, but also instrumental works and other works from around the same time that Messiah was composed. And those works are either maybe by Handel or by other important players or uh, composers from around that time period. The idea here is to showcase how Messiah kind of came to be, the, the piece that it is now. And, you know, for example, the Hallelujah Chorus is effectively now folk music. It is such a part of the popular lexicon but there's so much more behind the music. We are partnering with a number of organizations around the world actually to bring this program to you. So we are going to be partnering with the Irish Baroque Orchestra in Dublin, Ireland, with Handel and Haydn Society in Boston, and with a number of other organizations. And that program will be filmed in August and September, edited throughout the fall and released in December. Um, we are beyond thrilled to be working on this and Gary has been incredibly visionary as he's thought through this. Gary is particularly excited about the text of Messiah and how Charles Jennings, the librettist, really focused on um, social justice as sort of an undercurrent of the text that he chose for the libretto. So we're going to be highlighting that as well throughout the performance and we look forward to bringing that to you. Early spring, we will be releasing a film uh, led by Aislinn Noski, and that film will be the first time that the orchestra gathers together for a program of Concerti Grossi. And that program will include works by Vivaldi, Handel, and Corelli, including, again, the full orchestra. And we're so eager to have everyone back with us here in Portland for that filming. 
the dates for that, uh, I think I think we'll make sure that we release the dates for that. I, I can't remember exactly what that date is, and I apologize, but we will be sharing that in February. And then our final production, digital production of the year, will broadcast later in the spring, and that is a program led by Jonathan Woody, and it's a program of early Bach cantatas. And those cantatas really are focusing on sort of a light coming out, coming into the light out of a period of darkness. It'll feature eight singers, which we're really, really thrilled to be bringing here to Portland, as well as a chamber ensemble of PBO players. We will also be doing a series of live streamed concerts here in Studio Great Arts, and we'll be announcing more about those as we go. As you can probably imagine, a lot of this work has had to happen on the fly as we're able to release restrictions, have larger ensembles, and get clarity around what will kind of be the, the, the requirements as we move forward. And none of that is terribly certain, but one thing I think we can say now with certainty is that we have gotten very good at rolling with the punches and uh, changing course as we need to. And again, we are so grateful for the grace of our musicians and also for you, our patrons, for supporting us as we've been forced to do that this year. It's been beyond our imaginations and we, uh, we are really very eager to get back to some form of uh, kind of what we did before, business as usual, I guess you could say. Um, I want to clarify also that the, all of our programming for the year, both digital and in person, will be led by our four artistic advisors. Again, those four people are Aisla Noski, Byron Shankman, Gary Thor Wado, and Jonathan Woody. And those four people, extraordinary people, have agreed to lead us in this coming year of hybrid programming, both digital and in person. We are so incredibly lucky to have them here with us, and I hope that you'll visit our website, pbo.org, to learn more about all four of those incredible people. I also know that next on everybody's mind is, of course, what is happening with our artistic director, because as we know, Monica Huggett has retired as of the end of this season, and we miss her terribly, and I'm going to share a little bit more about how we're honoring Monica in a moment. But in terms of the AD search, the artistic director search, we have a committee that will be launching that search hopefully this fall. And we will be inviting candidates as soon as it is safe for us to do that with an audience and an orchestra together. Because here's the thing, we want this to be a process that includes you and includes our musicians. And there's no way we were going to embark on that in a time when we could not gather and have you experience these candidates and also get your feedback. So that search we imagine will launch in early spring. We'll be publishing the job description and then hopefully we'll be able to invite candidates starting in the fall of 2022. We will share a lot more about that as it becomes clear. We had an amazing plan in place uh, before COVID and of course we had to rethink that entire project. So as soon as we have firm details on that, we will be sharing quite a bit more information with you and there will be lots of opportunities for your feedback. I also want to be very clear, this is a search. We do not have a preordained candidate in the wings. We will be putting out a public job description and if you know someone that you think would be the right fit to lead PBO into its next chapter, I hope that you will share this posting with them because we want to attract a broad array of extraordinary candidates and bring the next person into this incredible ensemble that you have shepherded through the last 37 years. Finally, honoring Monica Huggett. Monica has been with us for 26 years and it has been her leadership that has created the organization that we know and love and the orchestra that we know and love. Monica is a singular absolute pioneer in this field. I know that all of us will miss her terribly and we're also so excited for her to embark on her next chapter which I know involves a lot of gardening and a lot of travel. She's embarking on her travel quite soon and so unfortunately we will not be able to have an in-person gathering in her honor. But we are launching two initiatives to honor Monica Huggett now and for years to come. The first is the Monica Huggett Fund for Artistic Vision and Excellence. And this went out, I believe, on Friday as our spring appeal, and this is a fund that will continue to exist moving forward. 
And this is an, a way for you, our wonderful friends and, and Monica's incredible fans, to contribute to her legacy moving forward. We have named this fund and it is restricted to support artistic operations here at PBO. So what's happening on stage? And I hope that you will consider making a special gift to the fund to support the great artistic work that we do here at PBO. That, uh, more information about that can be found at pbo.org. You may receive a letter in the next few days and you may also receive something from us in the coming months. But this is something that we are really honored to be able to have in Monica, in Monica's name and moving forward her name and the fund name will appear on programs, concert programs when that fund is, is supporting that project. It's a really special thing and just a small way of us marking our gratitude to our incredible artistic leader of 26 years. Beyond that, I know that many of you would like to offer your well wishes to Monica directly. And so we are going to be soliciting cards from you, cards and notes and love letters and fan mail. Please feel free to send those to us at our office at 610 Southwest Broadway. We'll make sure that our website is, is uh, updated with our address. And we will be gathering those cards and those letters and sending them to you or to Monica in late July. Now this is supposed to be a surprise and it feels a little bit weird to be announcing a surprise on the internet quite like this, but please, please forward those cards to us with that in mind that, that this is something that we are doing for Monica and we are going to send her a big, wonderful, glorious care package uh, in the next few months. So please consider joining us in that effort. I know that I'm probably running quite a bit ahead of schedule at this start the Q&A portion of the program. So stand by, we'll be right back with you shortly. So I am now joined by Rachel Smith, PBO's Director of Patron Loyalty, who has been keeping an eye on the YouTube chat and also collecting some of your questions in advance. 
and Rachel, welcome to the set. Thank you. We've been waiting to say that all season. Um, so let's start with some questions. I know we had a couple in advance and we'll start with those. Sure, so we have a question from Celia Carlson. Hi Celia. Uh, she asks, will you be commissioning new works by living composers for Baroque instruments and ensembles? Great question. So this is, this is a really extraordinary uh, thing that's happening right now in the world of period performance. More and more early music groups are commissioning living composers to write new works for period instruments. Um, we are excited to be working with Damien Jeter this coming year, and probably we will wait and see what our next artistic leader would like to do. Ultimately, it is that person's role to drive the artistic ship, and we want to make sure that we are right now kind of stewarding PBO in between artistic leaders uh, so that that person, when they arrive, can be the vision moving forward. So I would not be surprised if we end up in a world where, yes, we are commissioning some things here and there, but I think we will have to wait and see with Next Gen Artistic Leadership what happens with that. Great. I'm very excited about it. So the next question we have says, why haven't we seen more of the orchestra this season? Yeah, it's a great question. So as I mentioned before, our priority has been health and safety and ensuring that we are able to keep our orchestra and our entire workforce safe. So you will have noticed that, for example, in early productions, we had uh, Byron and Monica spread out but unmasked. And then the guidance became clearer around masking, and so we started masking our performers. And we had several big programs actually planned for the year, but as the guidelines started to become clearer in the fall, we had to scale quite back. We had to scale way back. We also even had to pause on production for about three months when Multnomah County was elevated again to extreme risk. And then we were able to get back into live performance in like February, March or in recorded performance. So it's been a moving target. And in order to avoid canceling work for people and moving people around and flying people in, and we, we chose to keep our orchestra small or ensemble small this year. Um, that has been a painful decision, of course, because we love our players and we want to have them together. But uh, we also recognized that having them together uh, in the aftertimes was the most important thing and for us keeping everybody safe and well during this crisis has been critical so um, yeah we'll see more of the orchestra very soon and in fact we're gathering a larger group together very very soon to start filming some of our projects in the fall and that's very exciting to all of us here they say absence makes the heart grow fonder absolutely absolutely so the next question says, this was submitted via email. It says, a lot of other Baroque orchestras have released videos that people have made in their homes. Mm. Why hasn't PBO done that? I've seen a couple of those as well. Yeah, um, I have too. And, you know, we made a choice very early that we were not going to, um, that, that we were only going to produce things that were, things that we were doing together as a team. Um, for us, Asking our orchestra to take on the technical production piece of filming themselves felt like something that was not a, the, the right fit for us as an organization. Um, and with the resources that we have, with the team that we have here, and with our equipment, we're able to produce a product that is uh, professional audio, professional video. We've actually got microphones right here above our heads. And that meant a lot to us. That was just a strategic decision that we made early on. Um, that being said, it's been incredible, and what a gift and what a privilege for us to be able to watch the work that musicians from all over the world have been producing inside their own homes. Um, and what an, what an incredible, weird gift to have access to see people in their home environments. Um, so congratulations to all of those organizations that have produced that incredible work this year too. It's a real glimpse behind the curtain. It sure okay. is, yeah, and it's, it's such a thing, I think, for all of us, you know, um, very early on, I read this, this article about how the Zoom era, work from home era, ended the mirage of professionalism because, of course, you get to see everyone's dog and everyone's child and everyone's, uh, you know, real lives a little bit. And, and again, that's, that's an incredible gift that, uh, that we've all had this year. So, Those were all the questions that were pre-submitted. And now, oh. if you have questions, Please enter them into the chat. We would love to hear from you. Yeah, please do. Uh, be, because we're not going to sit here and stare awkwardly at the camera. If we don't get more questions, we will end this stream um, a bit early. But um, it is a privilege and a pleasure to be here with everybody. And I think 
one thing that um, we haven't really said is that for us, for our staff, we have also been working remotely. This is maybe the fourth time, fifth time that we've seen each other in person this year on Moss. And it's an incredible relief for us to be back together too, wouldn't you say that? Oh, for sure. Yes, it's very, it makes you, give you a sense of normalcy. Yeah. That is and, really nice. And a little bit more of like, to have that professional work environment come back has been a relief to, uh, to be looking forward to things and making somewhat concrete future plans. I think, I think from now on I'll probably caveat all future plans as somewhat concrete. Um, but I think for all of us to have something to look forward to again is uh, really like oxygen. I'm so. I was excited to get to wear something that wasn't jeans or sweatpants today. Yeah, yeah we put on real grown-up clothes today. That was very exciting. So we have a question from Chris in Seattle. Great. They would like to know, how are our performers doing? Oh, yeah. Artists? What a great question. Um, you know, I think this is, I, I know, this has been an incredibly hard year uh, to be a performer. And I know that um, the grief of that has been breathtaking. It's something that I can imagine, but you know, our lives here in the office have been really focused on, you know, keep the orchestra, keep the, keep the organization going, keep the orchestra with a big O going so that we can really welcome back our players. And, and I think that has given us something really tangible to do. I know that for our performers, losing their, losing their livelihood this year has been very, very, very real. Um, and I think that any and all of our performers would welcome your, you know, your outreach and your good wishes. Um, I know that they're all very eager to get back to work and we're starting to see orchestras get back to work um, and we're bringing our orchestra back together very soon. So uh, I, I hope that this starts to feel a little bit more like normalcy, but I know this has been a really hard year for our performers in ways that really we can only imagine. Um, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth for them, um, but I do know that, that the grief has been profound. So thank you for asking. Our performers are top of mind always for us here in the office as well. Uh, we have been in touch with them uh, regularly. Uh, the very wonderful Andrea Hess, who's in the back of the room, hosts a uh, digital happy hour for our musicians every single Friday and has done that since the pandemic started. And so uh, we stay in touch with people, but it is not the same as being together and it is certainly not the same as being on stage um, sharing your incredible gift with the world. So, yeah. It's been really nice too in the Baroque Choir, which I know you've plugged that a couple times. The Baroque Choir. Have we um, mentioned the Baroque Choir? Andrea has, uh, Andrea has asked people to send in blogs and like a day of the life of musicians. And it's been really interesting to see the different kinds of projects people are doing, like the, like the really like fascinating like glimpses into their personal lives. Yeah. And, you know, their gardens and their cats and, you know, yeah. they play jazz on the side in, you know, so many different facets of people that you wouldn't ever necessarily see. Yeah, well, and I think also let's let's remember that our musicians, when they are on stage, they are performers, but they are very, very human beings as well. And so many of them have small children at home, which Rachel and I can both attest has been a really unique challenge of COVID times is like, what do you do as, as you're parenting small people small humans in this time and for our musicians who are parents they've been they've been dealing with you know figuring that out as well and so i you know the challenges certainly are the same as the ones that we're all facing but with this added element of of really being sort of unfettered from um or untethered i guess from uh every every part of your professional identity and and musicians I feel for you, thank you for sticking with us. We are grateful for you, and I'm sorry this has been such a terrible year. So we have a couple more questions Great. now in the chat. Um, so this is uh, also from Celia. Um, she asks, in this enforced downtime for the last 15 months, has there been an enormous flowering of composition? And I think we can also open that up to like just programming ideas, yeah. different kinds of concert like themes. Yeah, what a great question. I, I have been saying this all year that I am so ready for the post-pandemic renaissance. I am so ready for the post-pandemic renaissance. I think, I mean, that now we're getting into like my imagination, right? But I suspect that what is ha what has happened during this fallow time, this this time that we're all really in a group 
trauma. Um, I suspect that it's going to take a minute for that to turn into art, right? I think how we process grief and how we process trauma is, you know, we, we should get a psychologist <laughs> on here if we're gonna go there. But um, I do think that will turn into art because artists are like prophets, right? They, they interpret the world for us and they help us develop our moral imagination and artists by nature turn hard things into transformative experiences. That is what artists do. And so I think we can look toward that happening. Um, but I also want to caution all of us to be patient for that because artists are also processing this exact same trauma that we all are. And I think it's going to take a, a while. I mean, it's going to take a while for all, all of us to come out of this. Um, but I, I am eager to see what happens in the post-pandemic renaissance. I've been, I've been looking forward to that, holding on to that like, like a prayer since the beginning of this entire situation. Oh, yeah, there's going to be so much creativity and yeah. like transformative ways that maybe people didn't have a chance to explore before. Um, yeah, well, and I think, I think it's Terrence McKenna who said that, you know, something, something about how when you're going through a terrible thing like this, um, it's beyond your imagination what's happening, right? It it's surpasses what you can imagine. And so I think it is still unimaginable to us now what is about to happen artistically. Stranger than so, fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, board member Bill Willingham has asked, how were the four artistic advisors chosen? Oh, what a great question. Um, so we have had working relationships with these wonderful people in the past. Um, and really, when we started thinking about how to shape a season that we didn't know what it was going to be at the time, we didn't know if it was going to be digital, we didn't know if it was going to be in person. And so what we thought about was um, how can we get a lot of distinct viewpoints on stage or screen. Each of these four people has such a wealth of expertise and really varied expertise. So Byron Shankman is, of course, an amazing keyboardist and you've seen them uh, throughout the season on a number of projects and, and also coming up in the uh, Mozart Piano Quartets program. Um, but Byron is also exceptional at um, researching and discovering or rediscovering and bringing to life works that are sort of lesser known and especially by underrepresented composers so works by women work by works by composers of color um, it's it's just been an incredible thing to watch their body of work and really a privilege for us to be able to bring this to PBO uh, Gary Wado, I know many of you would have seen Gary do Our Messiah a couple of years ago. It was actually right before I started at PBO. Um, and Gary is this just, first of all, just a beacon of light and glory. Gary's just, just wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, but uh, Gary's also an expert in opera and in Baroque opera specifically, but also in um, really imaginative programming. And, and Gary and I started talking about this idea he had for this messiah kind of alternative um, quite a while ago and the idea of really kind of looking a little bit between the lines of the music and so Gary brings that expertise he is also utterly beloved by the orchestra and uh, I can't wait for all of you to get to interact with him even digitally because I mean I know I know that I am like over the top, but Gary's just kind of a national treasure. So there's that. Um, Aislinn Noski was scheduled to be with us actually this past November for a set of concerts that had to be canceled because of COVID. Um, and Aislinn is an incredible violinist. She is concert master for the Handel and Haydn Society. She plays all over the world. And she is just such an expert at um, music that sounds, feels good, and really ensemble music. And so that for us felt like a really important thing to bring in an instrumentalist whose focus is the orchestra and really wants to bring the orchestra kind of back together and, and give them music to play that feels really good. Because I think after this whole year, everybody deserves to, to do stuff that feels really, really good. And then Jonathan Woody is sort of a visionary um, Jonathan is a singer who joined us for the Mozart Requiem several years ago. Um, 
and he has just this unbelievably wonderful voice. He is also a composer uh, and does these fascinating programs, and he's worked all over the country, I think all over the world, and he's just an incredible colleague. He's so unbelievably thoughtful uh, in his approach to period performance, and also looking at what period performance can be moving forward, not just as a museum piece, but as this living, breathing thing. Um, and following his body of work has been a total privilege. I've been watching his body of work for a number of years. Um, and when we were thinking through how do we how do we expand to you know include vocalists in this upcoming season, he just seemed like an incredible, perfect fit for uh, bringing that level of expertise. So they were all chosen for really key specific musical reasons and uh, and they're also just incredibly nice. So it's exciting. It's gonna be really, they're all so different. I'm really excited to see how the season comes together. It's yeah. gonna be really special. It, it will be a total privilege, I think, and a lot of fun. So these aren't questions. Yeah. These are just comments from Great. the chat that I wanted to share. Um, you know, Celia loved your uh, discussion about the trauma and how this is like the, the you know, collective grieving. Um, she says she really hopes this will eventually result in a vibrant explosion of art and music, um, new modes of music and new forms of presentation, which I think this really, this for us, this was a completely new more mode of presentation. And, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it's been a, a lot of learning. Um, yes, and, and everybody sort of uh, has tolerated me repeatedly this year, sort of yelling at the sky, just think of everything we're learning, just think of everything we're learning. Uh, but it has been absolutely that, yeah. And Celia, you've also been an incredible MVP of our YouTube chats. Uh, thank you so much for being such an awesome, awesome fan for every one of our premieres. Uh, thank you. We, we, and I do want to say that all of you who participate in our premieres, all of you who comment during the, the premieres and on the YouTube, uh, link afterwards on the YouTube video afterwards. We see your comments. We treasure them. We love knowing that you're with us. Uh, it feels doing all of this work in a vacuum has been um, really challenging, which is partly why I can only imagine what it's like for our performers. Um, and so I think uh, I, I think I just want to emphasize thank you for being present with us. It means a lot. It really it does. Means a lot. It, and it's I mean, I moderate all of these chats, and I think that it's 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 different than in, an in-person performance because people are a little more, like, candid, I think, yeah. and it really is really interesting and special to see, like, what did you really think about that? People have no, like, problem telling you, and um, it's also been really interesting, I think, for the performers to get to see, like, you know, for pre-recorded things, like, to, to really interact with the people while the music is happening, so, like, you know, Byron was especially great at this when yeah. they were doing performances explaining like the temperament and talking about the harpsichord. Yeah. Um, and it's a completely different like look into this world that, you know, our patrons would never have the opportunity to have otherwise. And while we, you know, I can't wait to be back in the concert hall, it's really kind of interesting and special. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the ability for our performers to interact with the audience and answer questions in real time has been a lot of fun for us to watch. I will never forget one of the first premieres that we did. Somebody asked Monica Huggett about like her bow grip or something like that. that was and she was able to really explain how that came to be. And, and I learned, I've learned so much from our performers through the chat this year. It's been yeah. really something special. Not the same as being in the concert hall, but utterly, utterly different and also special in some way. So Adrian D says, uh, he says, your attention to mask wearing has been phenomenal. The videos have been wonderfully produced, a loving homage to the buildings you perform in and the artists performing. The intimacy you've been able to create is awe-inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, and, and I think um, the masking, the masking for our performers was so crucially important in terms of keeping people safe. And I know that, um, particularly for singers, masking is a big lift, like to get the enunciation and, and especially like when you're singing, um, and Arwen Myers did a really beautiful job of explaining this to me, so Arwen, I'm gonna paraphrase you hopefully pretty correctly, that the mask changes the way you hear your voice and changes sort of the overtone structure of what you can hear in your voice. And so um, that's incredibly vulnerable because we are recording you and you can't hear yourself in the same way. Um, 
And again, I just give massive kudos to our performers for jumping, uh, taking this big jump with us and also trusting us on it. Um, because it is, it is a colossal ask to say, please do this incredibly hard thing that you're extraordinary at and wear a mask. Um, but I stand by that, that decision because we kept everybody safe all year. Uh, and, and we were able to present great music period and, and that is of course the mission of the organization and it's meant a lot. So thank you and thanks, thanks for that lovely comment, Adrian. So uh, this is a question from a Moana Newman. You may know her. Oh, yeah. Um, she says, what would you say are the most effective ways your supporters can help PBO this summer? Well, friends, Moana Newman, who you're all going to meet very soon, is Portland Baroque Orchestra's new director of development, um, who will be joining us very, very soon uh, in, in the office. And we are so excited for you to meet her. And the question, how can our supporters help us right now? What a perfect question. She's Moana. doing her job. Good job. <laughs> um, so obviously, you can make donations. That's a huge, huge deal for us. Uh, Please make any contribution at any time. Right now, we're sort of waiting until we're able to sell tickets again, and that is, again, a huge portion of our revenue stream. And right now, we're just sort of holding on with contributions. Um, so consider making a donation. But of course, there are some other ways that you can help us too. So for example, you can watch our YouTube premieres. You can share our videos. You can um, share our social media. You can make sure that uh, friends are seeing all of our videos and, and kind of evangelize for us what's happening. You can also tell other arts organizations about the Studio Great Arts Services and invite them to consider contacting us to present their own live stream. And the reason that these things support us, even though they are not giving us dollars, is that they're giving us viewers. And funders like to know how many people are seeing you. They like to know that it's a broad uh, demographic of people seeing you, and that's hugely valuable to them. It also gets the word out about who we are. And I'm just going to go back to that statistic from earlier today, because in a normal season of ticketed concerts, PBO serves between like seven and 9,000 people with period performance, with great music, period. This year, we served already around 135,000 people, and that is breathtaking. And a huge percentage of them are people who have never come to PBO before. I mean, we, we know this. There's a huge percentage of them who are younger viewers that, that have not come to the concert halls before. And I know that many of our audience members talk a lot about audience succession. So the ability to leverage our digital programming not only for dollars now, but also to cultivate future audiences. This is, this is improving our business model moving forward and, and really increasing our sustainability. Um, so the more that you can advocate for us, the better. So yeah, make a contribution, but also share our stuff uh, and make sure that all of your friends know about this work that we're doing. I have to say that the thing that is, you know, people talk about audience succession, it's a huge deal. People are very worried that, you know, our audience, what happens? I think that, you know, having digital content that you can share with people, it's such a easier, you know, foot in the door for, for new people to be able to experience what we do because they can spend even five minutes, you know, on their phone or computer or tablet and, you know, really get a taste of what Baroque music is, what Portland Baroque Orchestra is, and that way when we can have live performances, it's not going to be, you know, the barrier of not knowing yeah. is, is, you know, more or less gone for a lot of that. Exactly. And so, you know, people are going to be much more likely, I think, to be able to to come and to join us and, you know, to see the new faces yeah. in the hall that, you know, we really want and we're excited about to share yeah. this experience with. Well, and I also want to just say that, that, you know, we made the conversion to digital within 48 hours of the shutdown. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, it, it was our incredible network of friends and family uh, who had the skills to really transition as quickly. But there was one other immense factor to that. And that was that earlier that year, we had gotten a grant from the Union Pacific Foundation to begin capturing concerts on video. The idea being like we would capture them, maybe share them, maybe not, but we knew that in order to attract new audiences, we needed to have a digital presence because 
very few people are willing to, and I include myself in this, are willing to take a chance on something new, buying a ticket on something if they can't kind of establish first that they're probably going to like it. Wow, $60 can be a lot of money exactly. to, to try something. To, to, to taste something for the first time, it, it is a big risk. And so we got this grant to capture just some concert video to get it up on our YouTube because I think before that, the, the most recent video had been several years prior and it wasn't even, it wasn't a concert video, it, it was just sort of a fun hallelujah chorus, I think, for I the think Portland so. Timbers, which was super popular. Um, so we got this grant from Union Pacific and it enabled us to hire uh, people to come in and do our, uh, do our initial concert video, but that also enabled us to very quickly press purchase uh, about two days before the shutdown on a very small video rig, which if you look back in our social media, you can see it was a tripod and uh, I think a Canon um, fixed lens kind of camcorder thing and a live stream box and um, like a power strip or something like that. And that was what we used for our very first live stream. And that's also what we used for our first several videos. So when you look at our first several videos, those were all filmed with one camera uh, and one tripod. <laughs> and as the year has progressed, we've been able to, with, an, with the help of another grant from the Union Pacific Foundation and some other wonderful funders, uh, we've been able to bring in all of this gear. And Adam, would you mind just showing everybody kind of what the setup looks like here? Can you do that without too much trouble? Uh, I've also had several shout outs to Adam Lansky from Celia oh. and from Bernadette. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Big fans of yeah. Adam Lansky, our camera operator. Yeah, and Adam Adam is the person who really kind of came up with the whole live stream rig um, and made that all kind of just happen in approximately 48 hours, and he's been with us all year. So, Adam, take it away. Show them the room. Woo! Feel free to wave, guys, as they, <laughs> they walk by you. Uh, and this is sort of related to that about digital programming. Alan Brickley asks, do you anticipate digital format being routinely available even after the return to normal? Oh, yeah. Alan, I think that's, that's one of the biggest questions on everybody's mind right now. Um, I do not see digital going away. I see this as a yes and kind of scenario. And I also, again, you know, at this point in my life after going through this last year, I think I, I, think I can say, you know, Yes, and I think, um, but I, I think that probably we will be pursuing digital programming in addition to our in-person concerts moving forward. We don't know yet what that looks like. Does it look like these post-produced projects that we've been doing, which um, just to be clear, we capture the footage and then we spend hundreds of hours uh, going through the footage and, and turning them into the final films that you see with an incredible team that involves editors and color correction and some on some on our team here on the ground and some in other places read means our colorist has been hard at work for us all year um, but I, I don't know if it includes that as our primary digital content or if it will be live streamed concerts we don't know the answer to that yet but we do know that access to our audience is so important and we also know that for um, many of our audience members the ability to access our concerts um, you know, some, some of our audience members are not able to join some of our concerts because they happen at night and they no longer drive at night. Um, we have audience members who used to come to PBO every single concert and then moved to faraway lands like Connecticut and now they're able to join us for all of our concerts. So I hope that digital remains an ever-present part of our model moving forward and it will not replace in-person in performance. Um, we're all ready to get back to concert halls. Yeah, I think it's one of those, it's wonderful to have. I think it's the way that we're gonna get new people into the door, but yeah, it's never the same. It's not the same, yeah. Um, don't have any more questions. Well, now. that's perfect. I think we're about at about five minutes. Um, we did it. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. This is last call for questions. That's um, it. But you can also always comment on the YouTube video or you can email us at email at pbo.org. Uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions one-on-one -on -one as we're able. Um, understanding that sometimes the answer is, we don't know yet uh, in, this, in this era. We're still working on, on knowing, but we welcome your questions anytime. We look forward to reconnecting with you 
And again, thank you so much for joining us for this grand experiment that was the digital town hall. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Abby. Thank you to the entire team behind the cameras today. Uh, and we hope that you have a wonderful evening and stay cool this weekend because wow. Okay.